So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to be painting on a collar, getting that looking a little bit more like gold. I'm going to work on his septum, his sec, uh, scepter. And uh, then I'll be updating the tones in the body, in the face, in the nimi, uh, in the uraeus. I'll be working on raw a little bit. Let me see if this is going on with that. I might hit that with another layer, the sun disc with another layer. Uh, build that up. So essentially that's what I'm going to be doing. And, um, you know, just continue uh, along that vein, you know. Um, um, basically, you can actually see, I don't know if you can even see this, uh, but basically I'm just building up layer after layer after layer. The layers are translucent, transparent, and uh, I'm liking the way it's coming along. So it's going pretty good. Um, now, I was going to work on Maya uh, Raina as Maya next after this painting. However, uh, I've got to do a 3D model. So I can either model it in clay. I can either model it in clay or I can... Uh, I can model it, uh, I can model it, let me just bring my little chair out, or I can model it in, uh, <clears throat> I can model it in clay, or I can model it in, um, 3D, you know, I could go into a 3D program like Maya or Blender or something like that, and I can model it, but I'm going to be working with some, I have a, 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 a friend, a, a, a student, 3D student, uh, artist that I'm kind of tootling. Okay, how's it going, Louis Young? Waving at you. Mabo, what's up? Hello there. How you doing, Mabo? How you doing? Good to see you. As always, good to see you, Mabo. Uh, and uh, Mabo is my special person. And uh, I think a lot of her. She's just a wonderful person. Um, but anyway... Uh, I'm going to be, I, I don't, I'm going to do Raina on the throne as Mayat. Some people would think this Isis. Some people would think it's Hathor. Uh, basically, a lot of them have the, the Kemet women, women have the wings. That's where the idea of angels come from. Is, you know, the pictures of the meta nature. How's it going, dear Monte Cow? What's up? How you doing? Good to see you. So, um, essentially, that's what I'm going to be doing is, um, Sometime around next week, I'm going to be finishing this painting or getting this, pronounce this painting finished. I'm going to sit the painting to the side and I'm going to start on another painting. Now, uh, the problem is that I have a person that's going to do the 3D, a young young lady, this 3D animation. I'm kind of teaching her. I'm kind of her instructor. She allowed me to be teaching her. So basically, I kind of commissioned her to do my Maya character in 3D. And a 3D model does that, you know, the great thing about it is we don't have a lot of Kemet 3D art out there where people can go to a site and say pay $60 and they have a model of various African iconography. You can find Thor, you can find Wooten, you can find King Arthur, you can find Achilles and Hercules, you can find everybody else's stuff, but you can't find any African folklore characters. So I'm going to be, I kind of challenge this person to start at least on Kemet. And then after Kemet, uh, this person is going to be, you know, perhaps working with some other stuff, you know, and building her portfolio up at the same time while helping me out. And then that way I can kind of remodel my characters or put my characters in different camera angles to get. How's it going, Sema? What's up? How you doing? Good to see you, man. Good to see you waving back at everybody. So basically, uh, I want to do that. So basically, I'm not going to start on Maya until sometime around June, giving her a chance to get finished. So I have two paintings I, I want to do next. Either Lincoln Visits Richmond or, uh, or the war between the Powhatans, the T Seneca Mocha, the Powhatans, 1644, and the Colonials, the first Jamestown settlers. That actually was a war. That war is not really taught in American history. That's why I want to do it. So if you guys could let me know through the comments or DM me or send me an email, whatever, let me know which painting you would like to see next. Lincoln Visit Richmond or the Tosinica Mocha Wars. Uh, because I'm going to hold off on Maya until I can get this 3D model. That way I can move the lights around digitally and kind of like conceive, you know, doing my design part. 
I like to work with something actually 3D so I can play around with the dramatic lighting of this and play around with the pose and the model and all this. So <clears throat> that's kind of um, kind of nice if I can do that. So uh, let me know about that. In the meantime, I'm going to continue to work on this. I still have the collar to work on, the septum, scepter, and um, of course, then later I'm going to work on the onk a little bit more. I just I worked on this yesterday, so this paint is still wet in a lot of places down here, especially the darker tones, maybe a little bit of the yellow. I might build up some of the yellow today, but I don't want it to blend and get muddy with the darker tones. So I'm going to let this bottom part dry down here, down here where the onks are. And basically I'm going to be focusing up here, so this should be dry. Now the wings are not quite there yet. They're getting there. Some of the more heavy impasto areas, they're sort of dry, but this like this area that's a little thicker right there, that one is not set up yet. So I don't really want to stir any of that really nice impasto. So I'll probably work on this. I'll work on this area here, and I'll probably work on the Pyrenees Falcon and his second and perhaps like his um, some of his jewelry that he has on. And I might not only want to move the feet because it's down there with the onks and his wet paint down there. I don't want to really deal with that. So I'm basically dealing with this area in here and maybe the falcon and the sun today. And uh, so that's what I'm going to be doing. And uh, so I already got my palette mix. I already got my uh, mediums made. And so now I'm going to be grabbing my, and this is some tiny brush work today. It's not any real big brush work. It's just tiny brush. So I'm going to be working with my 10 over zero or 18 over zero. My zero, this might be some over zero. These are my Escado brushes. I love these. And I also am going to work with some of my Winter Newton, like something like 20 over zero brush. And this little select brush, I really like that. So these four brushes, the main brushes I'm going to be working with, I'm going to keep these two on standby just in case I need them, but I don't need them. And actually this liner brush, keep that on standby as well. So so I'm going to be working with four brushes today. Today I actually have a pocket so I can keep my brushes in my pocket. So that's pretty cool. And uh, start getting in here, just bringing this tone up. Right now the yellow looks like yellow. And I really need the yellow to start looking like gold. And um, this is my base tone. So um, I like to paint on top of this yellow. I don't want to paint on top of white to make my stuff. There's a lot of blending. What I want to do is avoid the blending and paint the gold tone on top of yellow you know so that's basically what my whole focus is today is to get that accomplished and i think that would be a major accomplishment if i can get that done today and i put my main example somewhere and i don't know where i put it and that's probably not not the smartest plan you know but um i did a lot today I basically, uh, I kind of worked on this one a little bit today. And I painted the, made sure all the sides was looking good on it and everything. So I had to lay it down flat. So I did a lot of stuff today as well. So I think I'm going to just keep my brushes, instead of holding them, I'm going to just keep one in my pocket. And then I'm going to start out with this select brush. I'm not going to have my stick yet, but I might. Uh, let me get this out of the way. But I might uh, grab it pretty soon, pretty quick and start working it. As a matter of fact, looking at my examples, and most importantly this example, I might be able to work on this out of my head quite a bit, this, this particular thing. I'm going to be using quite a bit of uh, lemon yellow and yellow ochre in this, and I'm already going to get I'm gonna get this palette out of my hands already. See, I'm gonna do that by simply putting it here, nice and tall and close to me, using these apple boxes. I'm hoping I'm not obscuring the view of the painting too much, but for, for convenience of working, I think it's nice to be able to put that there. And uh, my examples. I need to put that somewhere too. So, yeah, I'm building up some, some blocks here. <laughs> and these are nice because they're like little makeshift tables. And it's just good to have that. 
So I can actually put my palette here and my reference here. Okay, so I think I'm in pretty good shape here. And I got my sticks. So I'm gonna be doing a lot of stick work and uh, small brush work today. So I'm getting some um, cadmium yellow medium to start because I really need to warm that yellow up. The yellow is too lemony, too bright. And I might just add a little bit of yellow ochre to that. And basically I have a gal kit with some Gamsol in it. But this is mostly gonna be lemon yellow. I might even add some orange to it a little bit or some red, uh, cadmium red to make this more orange. But for right now, I'm gonna start out. And what's happening with this collar is it's browner on this side, it's yellower in the middle, and it kind of starts to lean to a greenish tone as it goes to this side. So I'm gonna to try to create a little bit of modeling effect that way. But I'm gonna start with the yellowy in the middle first. And so I'm gonna mix a little bit of this on the palette to get that going. Like I say, and this, this basically gold tone is just some yellow ochre mixed with some cadmium medium. Cadmium yellow medium. And I don't know right now which one is more that I'm gonna to lean towards. I'm gonna to lean towards more of a uh, yellow ochre or cadmium. And I'm getting a little, I need to kind of prop this up and get a little bit of glare. So let me do some propping. And I made these little cookies today. Energy food to keep me gone. And some green tea. So that's always a good thing. And somebody's waving, so let me go wave. Michael Phillips, what's up? How you doing, man? Brad, you can come by again today and see me. Appreciate it. Okay, so basically, um, let me get one more squig of tea. That gets me kind of hyped, nice. Good, warm green tea. Antioxidants in it. And just a little bit hyping you up, you know, so it's all good. Okay, and so I got a little bit of cadmium in there. And I'm looking at my references. And I don't even know if I need these references, but right now I'm going to go in. And what I'm really doing here is I'm putting another tone of yellow on top of the tone that I have. To create um, those layers that I was talking about, those layers of goodness on the paint, where it doesn't look like it's just all laid down in one creamy layer. Sometimes that's nice too, but sometimes that looks a little too painterly. It looks a little too, it's hard to keep that neat. And so when you're trying to keep the paint neat, and I do like this tone that I have. Again, this is just cadmium yellow with a little bit of yellow ochre mixed in. These colors are very similar, but when you mix them, you get a slightly unique color. Right now, my pinky finger is fairly clean, so I really don't need to use my stick too much. I only need to use my stick when my, my fingernail on my pinky finger starts to get dirty. <laughs> and when that happens, I gotta go to my, my stick. Okay, so. And the great thing about it, these colors have, the bottom coat on this has got a chance of yellow. It's got a chance to totally dry. So I can paint wet onto dry, which is a very good thing. It really helps with coverage. In addition to doing this, I have to take my time because these are little intricate shapes. But what this allows me to do is small up some of these thicker, darker lines that I have in here. You know, just make them a little bit more thin by covering over them to some level. And I am painting on this particular coat with a fairly thick coat of this cadmium yellow mixed with yellow ochre color. And the whole idea with this is to try to clean up those lines from the darker tone that I have here using this cadmium yellow, which is a pretty good covering yellow, especially if you mix with a little bit of yellow ochre not only the yellow ochre gives it the right tone for gold, but it also helps with covering the colors underneath. So what we're going to have is we're going to have a semi-translucent, nice warm yellow that reveals a little bit of the tone underneath, of the nice bright yellow underneath. 
that also reveals a little bit of the darker edge. And that's the edge that's going to be the edge that the actual, the stone that's inlaid in this gold is going to be poking through, you know. It's the three-dimensionality of that. Okay, and like I said, I'm going to take my time with this. And I'm using, this brush is working out pretty good. I would might move to my Escato brush. But uh, this one is just a little bit bigger. The hair is a little bit longer. It's a sable brush. It's giving me some pretty good coverage. I'm able to load the brush with a lot of paint. So that's a very good, that's always a good thing for me when I'm trying to cover something. And when I'm trying to glaze to be able to put down a nice good uh, loaded brush. And what I'm doing is um, I'm going to paint like a field of this. Probably about this swatch here and just kind of step back after a while and see how this new yellow tone works. And then see how well I'm cutting, you know, uh, narrowing the shape of that darker, like dark brown tone that I have in there. So I have about, um, I don't even know how much Galkit I have mixed today because I think I've tried to start it out mixing like 30% Galkit. Then I kind of was, was running out of one jar of Galkit. So I took Gamsol and just swooshed it around in there. So I don't know how much it brought it up to. It could be about 40% Galkit in this paint. So I don't know. I don't know. The paint seems to be going on, not necessarily shiny, but seems to have a nice luster to it. It's not going on dry at all. So it might have, you know, and this is one coat. Now this first yellow is not very, it has the just a satiny kind of color to it. It's not very glossy at all. And in some places it's right flat because probably I was mixing in more Gamsol or, you know, I was going back cleaning my brushes to get more Gamsol and less oil or less Galkit uh, in, in each load of paint from this first yellow. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to just cover this section, each one of these layers. And then I'm going to step back so I can compare the lighter yellow tone that I already have down to the new darker yellow tone that I'm going in between each one of these little turquoise shapes that's surrounded by this dark brown shape or by this almost black shape, I should say. Because I have it, it's a, it's a, it's a tone, but it's deeply, deeply toned. So it could be purple, it could be brown. Or it depends on what you want to call it. It could read as black. However you want to read it, but it's just a dark tone. And it's the shadow tone. And I'm going to go, and I'm not trying to put down really clean pieces of paint. You know, I want some really nice, smooth, clean pieces of paint going between these. So I want to take my time and do some. And when you're doing this kind of painting, this is a pattern. And it's different. This is some meticulous painting. You definitely want to slow down the train and take your time with this. Or else you wind up getting a wonky collar. <laughs> Who wants that? Now, I don't want to start getting my pinky finger dirty. So, uh, and also I'm going to have to get my stick out. I think I'm at the point now where I got to get my stick. So I'm going to get my big stick as opposed to my little stick and start getting some stick action in. Okay? Let's get a little stick action going here. Okay, so that's good. That's working out nice. So just putting the color on just a little at a time. Really just trying to handle one motif at a time. Uh, this painting is not really done, but I'm going to say it's over 50% done. It's probably over 60% done. So all of this stuff that I'm doing from now on is just details, enhancing details. And uh, it may be even approaching about 70% done. So hopefully by the end of next week, if everything goes the way I think it should go, 
I should be finished this painting. I will stretch another canvas in this format, which is the uh, 69 by 103 inch format, horizontal. And I will either do Lincoln, Visage Richmond, uh, or I'm going to do the war between the Powhatans, which I'm going to call the war between the Tsenica Mocha, that was their real name, and the Colonials. I don't want to use the name that the people who defeated them gave them. Because that's actually not their actual name. I mean, it's a Native American word, Powhatan. Well, it's not, not even that. It's a hybrid word with part of the name being from their language and part of it being English. <laughs> you know, that's not their language at all. So what I'm doing is I'm just mixing just enough medium in it. Like I say, it's cadmium yellow medium with a little yellow ochre with a little bit of medium that's mixed about 30, 70. So it's going to be not really, really shiny, but it's going to be somewhat satiny. And perhaps it might be just a little bit luster sat satiny as opposed to matted satin. And because there's going to be a lot more layers, I mean, a lot more paint going on top of this one. So I don't know how much paint, you know, it depends on how long it takes to paint this. Now, last time when I painted this blue in or this uh, yellow in, or actually this, this brown tone in, I was able to do most of that in one uh, sitting, you know. As a matter of fact, I had some hours left to go. So that's a good sign. So that means that this particular pattern painting is not as meticulous and bad as it could have been for me. Like I say, when I'm designing these, I really don't think about how difficult it's going to be to paint. I just want it to be a certain way. I want to take my time. I don't want to rush this too much, but I just want to get this little section of it done so that I can kind of compare the yellow, the two, two different yellows to see if it's going in the right direction. And maybe I should have started more this way or more that way, because this way, this part right here, I might want more to be bright. So, you know what? I'm going to stop with this right here. I'm going to just go up and I'm going to go this way with this, this orange color, because I might have to mix some cadmium yellow light in it or even some white in it to create the uh, the specular highlights that I want. You know, the, the type of uh, reflectivity that I'm looking for. Uh, in, the, in the gold tone. But again, I just want really, really clean paint color going on right now. You know, yellow ochre, cadmium yellow medium with 3060 Gamsol and Galkit medium. It's basically what I'm using right now. Not really mixing it with anything else but those two colors right now. And I'm putting it on, you know, because it's a metal, I'm trying to put it on relatively flat. Not a, a whole lot of impasto. I do want it to look painted. But I don't necessarily, I'm not going for impasto. That's not like one of my motivations. What I'm going for is just really neat paint at this level. You know, the paint going on kind of even. And that's why I'm putting the Gamsol and the Galkit in there. Control the viscosity of it, you know and the evenness of it and the way the paint settles and self-levels. Trying to control that as much as possible. And so far so good. I'm mixing pretty good. The paint is still very, very covering. Somewhat semi-translucent. But yet, at the same time, going on very clean and very, like I say, yeah, easy to paint, easy to paint on, easy to brush on. 
And that's what you want. You want, especially when you start your session, that's why I like to do these collars and these meticulous designs when I first start a session because when you start getting tired, you don't want to do this kind of paint because what you start doing is getting sloppy. It's already meticulous, so you start losing your patience. And it, it just don't look as good sometimes when you do it that way. Sometimes you can get on top of it, it looks fine. But it's always better still to do it when you're fresh because you can almost guarantee it's going to be good then because this is the kind of work I like to, to save for, you know, when I first start my day. And here I am starting my day doing this. So, like I said, I have done some painting over there, but the painting I did over there was general painting. It's not like anything really hard painting. It was kind of like fun painting, <laughs> you know, because when the painting gets toward the end and you just dabble and hit little things here and there, the way it pleases you to try to get the painting to a high level, that is uh, the fun part. Getting it about, you know, when you get about to the 70%, well, that's why I say it's not quite 70 because I still got some major painting to be done on this. So, but when you start getting over 60%, it starts to get, the painting starts to come into focus and you start to feel more comfortable with the painting. That's a place I like to be at. And probably after today, I will probably be somewhere at 65 to 70%. I'm hoping. And definitely after tomorrow. And uh, like I said, I might, like I said, I'll probably take a filming break on Monday and Tuesday. And I'll probably use those days to stretch a canvas. I don't need to show that anymore because I've shown that once in live just to show it for this particular. You know, uh, for this particular set of Facebook lives that I'm doing. I've done it before, stretch canvas on other chances, but I just wanted to do one just for this particular group, just for this particular thing here, just so I can have it in the video library. You know, not to say that you guys are necessarily interested in it, but I am posting these to several art forums. And you know, um, the, the way what I'm doing here is I'm so, not so much teaching like Okay, this is how you paint an eyeball. This is how you paint a nose. You know, this is how you mix colors. Because I think most of that stuff is rudimentary beginning stuff. But I think we, even for beginners, there's no such a thing as a beginner. You, you, you're starting, but at some point you need to hear, you know, the specifics. You know, you know things like what I'm saying here, painting flat mixing the colors, how you mix, and basically just sit down. Nothing's going to replace hours and hours with sitting. Um, I remember back in my, um, in the days that I was working under professional artists, I would be sitting in the studio and some of these artists would be painting with you. Some of these artists be walking around in like an instructor kind of fashion, kind of peering around, looking at your work over your shoulder and that kind of thing. But the instructors and the people and the, um, the people who taught me or the people who were my mentors, especially if I got to be in their studio or they came to my studio or we went to some type of class setting, the ones that I like the most is the ones that actually set up an easel also. While you have an easel, they still walked away and appeared over your paintings. But as they worked, you got to see a seasoned professional person work. And there is no replacement for that. There is no tutorial that can give you that kind of help. So uh, if you are an artist and you are interested in um, perfecting your game, so to speak, I think it's very, very important to uh, to check out all my videos, watch them all the way through. Now, I, I say a whole lot of things and uh, comment on a whole lot of stuff, but at the same time, I do give a lot of very good pointers. And these are pointers that I'm encountering as I'm doing this particular work. So, especially if you do, even if you don't do work similar to this, I guarantee you there's going to be situations that you encounter if you're painting that's identical to these or it's going to help you. 
Uh, so, by all means, definitely watch all through the videos. If you're trying to learn, because uh, a lot of times all we want is that quick solution, you know? Okay, just do this, do this, click on that, do that. You know, especially with the computer age, just click this menu, flip this menu, click, 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 and it's done, you know? You go, you go get the instant bakery goods from the baking section at a grocery store. You throw it in the oven, and three minutes later, the cake comes out. <laughs> Almost basically baked itself. The person don't know anything about mixing baking soda, baking powder, and sugar, and flour, and all that stuff together. They don't know anything about how to actually make anything. They just know how to go step one, step two, mix part A with part B, set the oven for 350, and it's over. If you're not really a cook, you're a person who is basically paint by the numbers. And it's never going to work your imagination. It's never going to, you're never going to get the autopilot painting technique down the way you should or as fast as you should because you want a paint by number. You, the way you conceive about learning is from step one, step two, now do this, step three, try this. Okay, here's a five minute tutorial, you know? And how are you going to learn how to paint something in five minutes? You know, I, I just don't see it happening. And then if you're painting something, who cares, you know? How many mountain scenes have you seen? You know, you paint mountain scenes. And it looks like a mountain in Montana, Wyoming somewhere, you know? Yeah, so, you know, just go to Montana and see the real mountains. But how many times, or at a beach scene with the ocean spraying up, how many times have we seen that? So, uh, are we talking about anything that's historic? Are we talking about anything? I mean, like I say, uh, Delacroix, Jerry Colt. Study some of those artists. Study uh, what their motivations are. Don't just study people who made a style you like, like Manet or Renault. Or, or even back to people like Rembrandt and people like, uh, like uh, you know, somebody, so to Turner, stuff like that. You know, study um, the, 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 the romantic uh, artists that did, you know, like I say, uh, Derek Waugh, Jericho. Um, and it's just a, a, a bunch of uh, a really interesting artists that made some very fanciful work. Very, uh, and it was really work from their day. It was images from their, 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 their period in life. And, uh, and I think that's very, very, very interesting. So what I'm going to do, I mean, that's very good work too. And those artists don't get half the play because most people are looking. So now you see like a little bit of yellow, orange kind of working in there. And now I see that color and I should have probably gone out and looked sooner. And I'm going to continue that up to around in here. And I really don't want this orange as much because it's cadmium yellow, medium mixed with yellow ochre. But up close it looks fine. But when I walk away, it doesn't, it doesn't show reveal that lemon yellow as much as I thought that's underneath. So... I can either cut back and glaze more, but I don't get the coverage of the dark color tone. So what I'm going to do is just do some more of this, this layer right here that's closer to the neck. And then I'm going to go back into what I've already done, which is this section right here. Because uh, I do want to cut back that darker tone. I want to kind of trim it back with this color. But clearly what I'm going to have to do is mix a little bit of uh, raw umbra in there to brown this yellow up some. And I might even have to mix some Viridian green in there because gold sometimes has those little green tones in it as well. And so what we're trying to do is create the gold tone, not necessarily very yellows. Gold is not just yellow. Gold is often reflective, but it's not just yellow. So, but at the same time, my goal was just a little bit too yellow. And now it's a, in that particular section right there, it's a little bit too warm. So what it needs now, it does have a little, little attitude to it. Okay, somebody else is waving. 
Hey, I got a couple of people waving. <laughs> I didn't mean to neglect. Do Farrell Na Dinga. What's up? Man, there's a Mandingo warrior in the house. What's up, my brother? You know, Bawane Peleo. Harold uh, Struble. What's up? How's it going? Good to see you guys. So anyway, now, so um, that yellow, that tone in there is nice, but that's not going to be my only tone. So I don't want to hit it too much because I do have a darker tone in there. But what I want to do is I'm going to go back and I'm going to break up that yellow. It's not going to be solid yellow. I'm going to go with some lemon yellow. And I might even go with some whites. Mix a little bit of titanium white with that lemon yellow. So brighten it up so it's like different from the cabinet yellow me medium mixed with yellow ochre. And I'm going to just go hit some little glints of light right in the middle of that tone. So it's basically now I'm painting kind of wet on wet on that tone that I just laid in here on this section. And what I want is just glimpse of white, glimpse of white here and there. But not even light, like a lemon, light lemon yellow. With lemon yellow, cadmium yellow mixed with a little bit of titanium white. Uh, about 50-50. I want this to flow, so I want this to go over top a color that's already wet. Yeah, I kind of like that. And what's that doing by going over top that color is, first of all, it's giving that color a little bit more of a 3D look. A little bit more texture, a little bit more presence. A little bit more live, because the other one is flat. And I have the yellow underneath. So this is another little layer right on top of that layer. And I want to take my time with this. Right now, I kind of want to see it, so I'm hustling to get more color on it so I can see it. But I still want to, at the same time, take my time. And I'm liking the way that's tuning up. I'm really liking that. And I don't want the color everywhere. I just want it kind of in the middle of that tone. And I'm going to mix a little bit more white into it. And I really want to make sure this is mixed well and it's a good quality of paint. When I do put that little chunk of color in, I want it to be nice. Yeah, that's nice. So just adding these little chunks of colors, but I want them to be nice. And I don't want it to cover the red, the orangey color that's there. I want it to be just inside of that color. So imagine that there's a donut, I mean a hot dog and a bun. This light yellow color is the hot dog. And the warmer yellow that I put up, this orangey yellow, is the bun. So I'm painting like a little channel. And really, I'm not even painting the whole thing. I'm just painting like a little hot dog on each one of the facets of these triangles that's in this motif. And what that's creating is a little bit of a, um, a little bit of an edge. And I do want to take my time with this. I do not want to rush it. And it seems like what I'm doing right now is rushing it. And I just got to kind of slow down my patience. I do want to see it, but I need to do a lot more painting before I can step back from it just yet. This is not enough of it to get the full impression. But from what I'm seeing up close, it's looking pretty, pretty promising. And it's enough difference in this tone to be distinguished. I mean, I can see that difference. And from a distance, it kind of blends and creates that, uh, that little bit more 3D look of the actual gold inlay piece. Now, I don't really want this to mix too much with the color underneath. So I do want to keep this tone relatively fluid so it can just flow on top of. But not so, and, and of course, it's going to be semi-translucent. So it, it's going to be translucent, so it's going to reveal that color also underneath. 
and I'm hoping that it's going to be a good effect. And it's just a matter of how much white do I want in this. Because I don't want to get it back to the yellow, the really bright yellow. This is more like a creamy kind of yellow. As opposed to bright, intense yellow, yellow, yellow. It's more of a creamy kind of yellow. It's kind of sitting on top of that other yellow. I'm going to leave some of that other tone up, but I'm going to take this tone into as many of the elements as I can so I can see how it's handling with other elements. Oops, I got a little misplaced there. It's okay, I can come back and hit that. Not a problem. And there will be a difference between the way if I waited to this step dry, or if I paint wet on wet, over top this color with this, this new color, but I want to try this way because this way is actually even more uh, a thicker paint or just uh, a little bit more of a of a blend. There are it is some little brush stroke in it, not a lot, but it's it's some, and I think that helps. It does create a little bit of a blend issue. Especially if you reinforce that blood, uh, that uh, brush stroke any. So that's good. Okay, and um, just going back 
but this secondary color and I'm just before I cover the whole thing with one treatment I'm trying two or three treat treatments in one section just kind of experiment and this is the point where I'm experimenting actually I don't really know 100% what the outcome is going to be I have a good idea though and that's the fun of it you know if I knew what the 100% uh, of the outcome would be it would be as much fun painting it <laughs> uh, and a lot of times like I say some of the best painting is when you experiment and learn and you learn something new or you paint something new or you just paint some a different way to what everybody else is painting and that way is interesting I mean that's what uh, Van Gogh was doing he started a whole new movement I don't know if it was Brock or Picasso with the Cubism, but I think they went to Africa, saw some African work, and was inspired there. Then you got guys like Gauguin and stuff like that. They're in other countries looking at the work that these other countries have done. And then they come back to the French scene and the European art scene and kind of um, have a different look. But they're in other countries borrowing what we call today abstract concepts that these cultures was just basically doing quite naturally and it was quite acceptable for them to do it so you move from a a, 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 a realistic rendering render, rendering for you know basically pre-photography because you have photography being invented so hold it what's the point of having a photograph and having a painting. Painting does last a little longer, but the photograph is actually a light reflection of the subject, so that is the subject. Rendered by light and rendered by scientific principles, as opposed to rendered by somebody's brain. What they perceive is what they saw, you know? It may or may not be accurate. I mean, sometimes in the old days, some artists will give certain kings favorable looks, even though the king actually didn't look like that. You see one artist's picture of a certain king, he looks one way. Then you see another artist's picture of the exact same king, he looks a completely different way. You know, hold on now. Did he, what did he actually look like then? You know, and of course you have photography where the photograph doesn't lie as much. You can still make a complimentary photograph, but a, an artist can lie because his brain can translate the image. Not necessarily the way the light is actually rendering uh, the actual image, you know? Especially in the early days of photography, they weren't really interested in manipulating the camera so much. They were just trying to get, they were just trying to get a picture to, to render you know, chemically, you know? So, a lot of times those pictures just told the truth. <laughs> you know, whether it was complimentary or not. They just basically, that's it. Uh, where, you know, artists have always been able to, I'm not gonna say lie, but manipulate the image. Compliment. Make it look better than it actually looked or different. And I was just talking to somebody who said they didn't like uh, Egyptian work because the images look so ugly. I mean, because the, 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 the statues of compared to the Greek, which is a later period that borrowed and got a chance to see what was in Kemet and other cultures. And there's a whole lot of uh, advanced knowledge changing amongst humans. So they did have a certain advantage, but there are some of their images, but what you got to realize with European tradition, some of that stuff is not ancient Rome, ancient Greece. Some of that stuff is the 16th century, sometime around the Renaissance, where uh, certain skills and certain things kind of picked up. And then what they were doing, but they, they kind of did some fakes. It's like you see a lot of fakes. The Shroud of Sharon is a fake. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls is a fake. So a lot of fakes that happened through that period. People were faking a lot of stuff. 
So, uh, and then even in when, you know, when you get into what's really messed up, the science of uh, anthropology and the science of uh, archaeology, when people start faking the bones of uh, dinosaurs and cavemen, you know, because they wanted to get their career going. It was getting broke. They needed to discover something big. <laughs> so they just got some chicken bones or whatever, some cow bones and kind of kind of cut them and saw them down and did whatever they need to do to age it prematurely using some chemical process and say, oh, this is this. is this. We found this, this place. And come to find out that's a fake, especially when you start getting people the DNA test stuff modernly based on stuff that for a long time we thought was authentic. As it turns out, that, that person just needed some money. They got paid, but they made a fake. <laughs> You know, so um, that really muddies up science when you have that kind of stuff going on. But, you know, when your science is based on your culture too much, that's easier. It's easier to fake when, when you when your archaeology, archaeology is anthropology is different from archaeology. Anthropology is science. When you use a scientific proven principle to prove something is what you say it is. That's called anthropology now or closer to anthropology. I shouldn't say that's called anthropology. That's cloak anthropology is more descriptive. When something is conjecture, when you assume that this is what it should be, that's called archaeology. You know, one is more or less a theory, the other one is more or less proven. So you want to use both because you want to be able to theorize what these cultures was like. And at the same time, you want to be accurate <laughs> to what these cultures was like. So you want to have a little bit of anthropology and archaeology together so that you can have a really, really clean uh, a way to, first of all, prove what you're saying. It's always important to be able to prove what you're saying. You don't want to just say stuff because I see a lot of that in social media. People just Make it junk up and say it. <laughs> and then even sometimes, uh, you know, I'm unknowingly, because I, somebody's usually right about something, I would kind of, you know, share their, their post. And then later on, I found out that, why did I share this? They're usually right. So I just, I was busy that day, so I didn't read it clearly. I want to find out, hold on, this is dead wrong. Then I got to try to find it. Most of the time I can't. So now that's what people think that, that's my, my concept is. No, man, that's just somebody trying to spread fake news, like some people say. <laughs> you know? Spread some fake news over there, man. So you want to watch out for that, you know? So what I'm doing now is I'm coming back in here with kind of like a creamy white. Basically, it's creamy yellow. It's basically cadmium yellow light mixed with titanium and it's getting a little bit dirty with that uh yellow that i mixed earlier because i'm going wet on wet but not getting too dirty so i think i'm gonna just stop right there and i'm gonna just go back and i'm gonna look see what that's doing oh yeah yeah that's starting to shimmy a little bit yeah i'm liking that so i think i'm gonna continue that a little bit and then i'm gonna shift it up and change it but I'm going to finish up this little section with this because the vibrancy of these colors together and the way I'm painting it on is really creating a presence in this color, which I like. You know, because I want that to look very tactile. First of all, the example that I have, I mean, I got this color off the Internet. I mean, the picture, the, the reference picture. And uh, it's a pretty good reference picture, but the collar um, is not like the stuff from King Tut's tomb that's very well preserved. This collar has a lot of the stones that's fallen out or somebody plucked them out or whatever. The gold, by the way, is, but so it's just probably old. Whereas the stones just over time, the glue that was used to inlay the stones is mostly glue. And not necessarily ridges of metal that's holding the stone in. In some places, it ridges of metal. But a lot of times when people are putting in 
stone inlay. They can't really get all of the little folds of metal holding the stones. So they rely also, because I'm a jeweler also, they rely on glues. So the ancient people were no different. So what they have is um, over thousands of years, stones fall out. And so quite a bit of the stones on this particular example, this reference that I have has actually fallen out. So I have to assume the look of how this thing would be if the stones didn't fall out. How would this look, you know? I mean, you only have like 20% of the stones, maybe 30% of the stones still there. All the rest of the stones is gone. <laughs> so, and then even the ones that's there, you know, the gold is still somewhat pristine. I don't know if that's, I don't think that's a 14 karat gold, but the carat's probably pretty high. It's probably 18 karat, but it's not pure gold. Oh, oh, I didn't mean to do that. I did a little slip of the finger there trying to handle my stick. I painted over something, but it's okay. I'm going to be patient with that. I'm going to just paint that back in, let that dry and paint that back in. A little slip of the old brush there. My, I just came in and was trying to manage my stick. I usually have this is actually a square stick. I usually use a round stick, but I didn't realize that I would need a taller stick. So when I was in the hardware store, I did I just make these sticks. I just get a dial rod, a very long dial rod. You know, it was basically a cylindrical stick. Put a big ball of tape at one end and kind of make it so there's tape everywhere so the hard edge of the wood doesn't cut and tear into your canvas or sand your canvas down or sometimes you could be working and you're just really just cutting gouging out your canvas so that's where round and a lot of tape helps out now i could probably use a little bit more tape than what i have here uh especially around the, the first foot and a half and this is what I used to do, not necessarily a foot and a half, but a foot and some chains where I put this yellow at. I'm usually going to put some more tape there. That's why I put the yellow in there. Just so I can know, first of all, I know where to, how high to put it up on the canvas when I'm bearing down on it. You know, just so I can know it's up high enough for me to put some weight there. And also, it helps me to know when I'm building up the tape, you know, most, what's the most part? What is the part that's interfacing with the canvas? That part you want heavier tape on. And so that's how I make mine. You know, you can buy some sticks. They cost a lot of money. But essentially, it's a stick. <laughs> and you just get some gaff tape or some duct tape. You can even use, hey, I have somebody else coming into my room here. Hey, what's up? Laval, Apollyon, what's up, my brother? Good to see you again. Unk, Black Power. <laughs> I'm all, yeah, whole temp, my brother, whole temp. Whole temp, whole tempo. EM, whole tempo. <laughs> yeah, man. Unk, Sinev, Mayat, and Newt. Never time. Okay, I'm just going to add a little bit more cushions here because while, while I'm saying that, I just got an idea that I need some more cushions. So I'm going to just cushion my uh, stick up just a little bit more. And it's already cushioned.
Okay, just got a little bit, got a little bit more um, tape on my second. This is my scepter right here. This is my uh, Nectaru stick. Right, yeah, I, I do patal work with this. And I'm really liking the way that's popping off of there, man. That's tight. Do I want to do the whole thing like that? I need to sit back and look. I want to do the whole thing before I start my other treatment. No, I'm going to leave it like that and I'm going to tone it. I'm going to tone my base color a different way. So I'm going to go back over to my base color. And I think I'm going to get my palette to mix this so I can look at some different tones on the palette. I'm going to get some of this cadmium yellow medium. Mix it with yellow, yellow ochre that I had. That's a nice tone, but I'm going to mix a little bit of uh, raw umber in it. And that's going to make it kind of like a greenish brown. I like that tone. I don't want it to be too close to the tone that I are, the darker brown that I have there. So I'm going to mix a little bit more yellow ochre in there as opposed to the cadmium. Because I do want to have that kind of like a more of an earthy tone. And that's pretty good. I like that tone. A little bit more yellow ochre. Okay, now I got a good little bit of that tone mixed here on my palette and that's nice and thoroughly mixed I don't know how much more that I'm gonna need but let me go ahead and get some more uh oh don't want that in there so that must mean stop okay so now what I'm gonna do is start dipping my brush in that And this is going to be my new base tone. Now, I could go toward that. I'm going to mix another little color with some of that orangey color in there. And I think I shall do that. Since I got a little bit here, I'm going to make another little patch. It's halfway in the middle of that. I don't know how much of that I'm going to want because that's a little bit too orange. I got one leaning toward orange and one leaning toward kind of like a greenish tone. And those are kind of like the colors for my gold. I'm going to start out actually with the one leaning toward orange. Since the color that I already have as an undercoat is already kind of like having yellow, this one is kind of like uh, very analogous to that color, very similar to that. And what I'm going to do is just go into over that yellow. And I don't want it to be too dark because that's going to look too different. So I'm going to go back to this cadmium yellow with just some of that in the brush. Grab some more of that. And I think I'm going to get just a some kind of tone that's between that. I'm going to take it with my palette again. Because I might be going, that's why I want to mix these in advance. Because I might be getting too drastic too quickly. So I do want some incremental steps and tone as I get to the corner of that collar. And I think I have it right here. Put the first one on, it's just a little bit too dark. Yeah, this one's perfect. So I'm gonna start adding this tone about here. Yeah, and I think this tone is, is, is what I want right here for now. And I wanna go just all the way down with this. I'm gonna start this tone about here. I'm gonna break up some of that yellow that I already did in that one because this is starting to transition. And I do want to transition about here. I'm going over top that base yellow, just like I did with the other cadmium yellow mixed with a little ochre. This is yellow ochre with a little cadmium in it mixed with a little cadmium orange, mixed with a little bit of, just a hint of um, raw umber. Just to darken it up, just to give it a little bit more of a, and I want to mix this in even with some of that other tone that I have. This is gonna be my little transitional set of painting here. As I start moving toward a darker, more brown yellow, or I should say a yellow brown, over top that base yellow color. 
Okay, so, and then of course, I'm gonna do about, about an inch or two of this going that way because I'm starting to run out of real estate. I mean, I already got about six inches before I'm in that corner of the, uh, of the collar. And I do want to see some more of this color before I get there. So I don't want to run out of real estate too quick. So I'm not going to do it as much as I have with the other one. But I, am, I do want it there so I can, an inch or two might give me enough of an impression of what that should look like. Yeah, and that's about right there. I'm going to just bring that some into this. Bring it over here. There you go. And that's pretty good. The motif does get more narrow as it gets toward the top of the shoulder. So it gives me less real estate for my brush to fit into those little channels of yellow. So I might have to switch to a smaller brush eventually. But right now, this one is actually doing a pretty good job. I think this is the zero brush. Synthetic sable, I believe. And this brush holds up pretty good. I mean, for the, for the price point of this particular brush, this is Select, it's called Select. I got this particular brush from Plaza Art. Uh, but I think they sell it in other stores too. I think it might be part of the Princeton brush series. Don't know. I'm not a big, big, I mean, the, the, the bristle brushes, I would get the Princeton bristle, especially the hog's hair, because hog's hair is hog's hair. And most of those brushes kind of about the same. You know, when you get to the bristles now, when you get to the real high end bristle brushes, that's when, when you're paying about $30, $40, $50, $100, $300, $400 for a brush. That's when you start noticing that, okay, this hog's hair is different from, something is different about this brush than these other brushes. But do you need those expensive brushes to do good painting? Yes and no. Depends. If you're doing a lot of painting, I would say yes, because it's more comfortable, it's easier. You can get to the tones you want to get. You can get to the type of painting you want to get to quicker. The painting is easier. Comes to you. If you're a good painter, it's going to come to you easier. You know, your, your brush strokes is just going to happen. You're going to fatigue your body less. Things are just going to be, the world's going to be, the painting world's going to be much nicer to you. Let's put it that way. You know, now some people can't conceive paying three, four, five hundred dollars for one brush. Usually those are the fatter brushes, by the way, like the number 14, 15, I mean 14, 16, 18, 20, and so on. Especially when you get to your sable hair brushes. And sometimes it's like, sometimes people call them, you know, you can use water, some watercolor brushes, naturals, for oil brushes, for like detail work. For blending for stuff like that. I mean, I know sometimes the brushes say for acrylic, for oil, for watercolor, but that doesn't necessarily mean you got to look to see what natural materials are made out of. Is it made out of weasel hair or is it called sable made out of natural hair? That's not going to break down in any oil chemicals. Therefore, it'll work for oil paint. That's all you really have to know. Will this break down with biochemicals? Yes or no? And anything natural generally is not going to break down with oil chemicals. The synthetic stuff can because of the fact that the synthetic stuff is made out of chemicals themselves. <laughs> That's why it's called synthetic. They take two chemicals or three chemicals or whatever, mix them up together, and they come up with something else, you know? Okay, I'm gonna back off from this a little bit and they make a fiber out of it and I kind of like that. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start creating the modeling here. I'm gonna bring this down kind of even with this little tone here to make the kind of reflexivity that I need. 
So I'm just going to take this color and just take it into the existing colors of yellow that I have. With this, it's basically just a little bit, a little bit of raw umber mixed in with uh, cadmium yellow, mixed in with yellow ochre to get this kind of darker tone with a little bit of, of cadmium red in it, just a hint. And what I'm doing is just trying to create this little section where we have a darker tone. Then also I kind of clean up some of those darker lines that surround the uh, turquoise inlay. And I just, yeah, okay, so that's pretty good. Okay, so that's good. All right, now once I get about where I think I need to be with this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to even get a little bit darker as I get into that shoulder. Just get a little bit darker. But first, I want to take this darker, warmer, this more browner color of yellow in this little area up just a little bit further. I don't want to get too anxious because I'm liking it. So what's happening is I'm not really taking my time with this tone like I should. And my painting is getting a little bit, I'm painting a little bit too rushed. I don't want to do that. I want to still do very clean, meticulous paint. Don't want to rush too soon. Don't want to do too much too soon. Just want to get this continually going. Not too much, too soon. Okay, so now that's getting to the point where I kind of want to start to turn it a little bit to a darker tone. Just going to go up a little bit, but one tier higher, I think. And I still want to take my time and paint it. I think I just need to mix in a little bit more tone and color. And that tone might be getting too spread out, so let me use my palette. Keep it nice and together. Okay, that's looking pretty good. All right, a couple more little sections. I think we're ready to move to a slightly darker tone. Again, I don't want to start rushing because, uh, you know, you get excited, at least I do. All right, now at this point, well, I'll get one more little sector that I'm looking at that I want to paint. Then I'm going to mix, go with my darker tone. I just want to get this one in. I'm going to go dark yet on that one. Okay. Okay, now, what I want to do is I'm going to move a little bit darker to another tone. And this one has more orange in it. I don't even know if I want this. Much orange. Let me see if I can find another spot kind of in the middle. And it is orangey, so 
Let's see. Let me put it down. Yeah, I think that's okay. I think I'm going to go like an inch, maybe an inch and a half with this tone before I shift it down into even a darker tone. Because it start, it's going to accelerate as I get into the shadow. It's going to get darker and darker in terms of going over this base yellow, create my gold tone. The gold tone is going to appear to be darker as we recede into the shadow. So this is going to go about an inch more in to the shoulder area on the collar with this particular tone. And I might just continue that for an inch and a half because I like that tone. It's looking good on there. I'll go an inch and a half. And then of course, as we get very, very close to the collar, because we got about, after this inch and a half, we got another inch and a half more. It's almost gonna be like, uh, like I say, it's gonna be more brown than yellow in terms of the description of the collar. It's gonna be kind of like a gold brown. Because I still have the darker tone, I do want I don't want a color that's so brown, it's even with the darker tone of the inlay of the turquoise. <clears throat> so I don't, I don't want it that dark, but I just want it dark enough so it looks like it's catching the light differently than the tones on this side or in the, in the, ch in the middle of the chest area. So I want the, the, you know, I want the tones to kind of slowly uh, model in, you know, like the gold is reflecting luminous, you know, it's the same color gold, but it's kind of giving, reflecting the color back differently in different places. Okay, so once I get about here, that's looking pretty good, and that's kind of giving me sort of the effect I want. I don't know if I want to get too, too dark, too, too quickly. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit further, then I'm going to get a little bit darker. 
And so it's got about an inch or so before we get to that last darkest tone. And that's when I'm going to come back with a lighter tone and hit inside of there. So now that we got that, you can see that's starting to change tone. I'm going to back up some more from it. Back up a little bit more. Hey, what's going on in my room? I got some people. Hey, another person waving. Hey, Isad Mina, what's up? Is it going, Isad Mina? John Moore, what's up? How y'all doing? Good to see y'all. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is go into the very corner tones. And I might just even let the shoulder look like it's catching a glint of light. So I'm just going to go like a, maybe a half an inch with this greenish uh, yellow tone. Basically, it's like yellow ochre with some, uh, with some raw umber in it. But actually, it has a little bit of cadmium in it. And I'm just going to go up with this tone. Now this tone is very similar. It's, it, well, it's not very similar. It's close in hue to the kind of brownish tone I have that goes around the turquoise. But that's how I get sometimes. Sometimes your, your tones become more even. So this tone is just getting just that much darker as it gets towards the shoulder. And I might just leave like a quarter an inch, half an inch or so of a glint of this yellow tone still there. Don't know. Don't know yet. I have to see. But it's not really even that much of this, this more mustard kind of, um, this more brown or greenish yellow. I mean, all, all we need now at this point is just a little bit of that to get that across. You know, that the, that the yellow gold is changing in tone. We don't need a lot. We just need just enough because we, because, you know, your perspective is getting compressed anyway as we get around that corner. And closer away from the chest is up further. Okay, I'm going to back off now because I don't know, I don't know exactly how I want that glint of light off of that. And do I even need that? Actually, to tell you the truth, I don't even need it. I want to take it even further. If I do leave it, I'm going to leave like now. It's going to be less, less than a quarter of an inch of that yellow color. That's if I don't just cover the whole thing over. Because I kind of like this, 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 this browner tone here. I actually kind of like it. Okay, that looks pretty good. We doing it. I'm liking it. Okay, and I'm almost really, I'm, all, I'm not even leaving that much of that yellow at this moment. I'm almost covering all of it up. And remember, if I don't like it, if I want to bring it back, I can just paint over this. All that's going to do is build up my paint even higher. I don't mind that. That's going to be kind of cool. It's not a big deal. I'm going to leave a little bit there. Just a little bit. Walk away. See how that looks. Yeah, that's nice. But don't need it. As a matter of fact, I might even take this tone down darker. But I don't want to because that's not what I'm seeing in a reference. I'm just adding a little, you know, I'm cheating it a little bit. And I can do that if I think uh, it'll help the image to look more contrasty. I mean, we do this stuff all the time. I think a lot of times we say, paint what you see, but you just assume that the, the photograph has already been manipulated in Photoshop by somebody else perfectly. And a lot of times you can do that if you paint from a photograph because oftentimes some photographer has worked in some image editing software or procedure on a photograph already. And so you're just benefiting from that. However, as a painter, they could have worked on that, but maybe you can paint it better. You can paint what somebody can do in Photoshop. And I would argue, since this is a painting, you can actually paint more intense color.
than you can achieve in any uh, screen or printer can print. And so whatever you can do in Photoshop, you can do with paint times 10. Because you can just make your paints darker, richer, more, the colors is more intense. And it's just certain colors. You, can, you have to buy the color. But it's just certain colors that Photoshop just can't give you. It just can't. <clears throat> Photoshop can't give it to you. The, you know, you need a big wide color space uh, on your uh, monitor to just be able to see it, much less to manipulate it. So, you know, when you turn to color space, you're talking about the monitor's ability to render the color so you can actually see what you're working on. Well, I can see what I'm working on because guess what? It's right here in front of my face. I can see it really, really clearly because the color that's on this brush is the colors on the brush. The colors on my palette is the colors on my palette. And the color that I'm putting on the paint on the canvas is the color that I'm putting on the canvas. So there is no, there is no special monitor. I just use my eye to the paint. So you can really, really get into manipulating your tone that way. Now you can see the uh, collar, the volume of the collar starting to come out. Now what I'm going to do is take it from here and go this way. And in this way, I'm kind of going to lean it a little bit more to green as it models in here. So I'm going to go from a, like a lemon yellow right about here, just about here. From here to here, kind of like a more of a white lemon yellow. Then I'm going to go from white lemon yellow to a similar kind of color to here, but this goes to a warm brown. And in this way, I'm going to go more to a green as I go to the left. So my base color is going to go down. And what I'm going to do is put my stick down for a minute. Okay, and then I'm going to just get a paper towel and I'm going to clean off my palette knife so I can mix a better color. I'm going to get a little bit of lemon yellow. Well, not lemon, I keep calling it cadmium yellow light. And I'm going to get a little bit of titanium white. Mix it together. This is going to be my main color here that I'm mixing. And I got about 50-50 actually. Because I wanted more yellow than I want white right now. Because I'm going to be adding white to it in other tones as I go. So now I have that mixed. Um... I still have white on my palette. I'm going to clean my brush. Use the same brush. It's been doing pretty good. And basically, that's all it takes to clean it. It's clean. Uh, synthetic brushes clean really easy. Now, I wouldn't clean it for the end of the day like this, but because I would definitely use a Gamsol plus soap, uh, dish soap, and uh, hand soap. But... This works good for just a quick clean between different colors. Slightly different colors. So they're still all in the yellow family. But right now I'm just mixing just the, the medium just with some titanium white just to get the flow. Just get a nice flow right beside that yellow. It's just titanium white mixed with medium. Our medium is 30% Galkit, 30%, I mean 70% Gamsol. Somewhere in that neighborhood. Okay, so now that I have that, I'm going to kind of look at this a little bit. And I do just almost want some light tones, like about right in here. And I'm almost going to go straight white right here for now against that. Because I know eventually, and miraculously my pinky finger is still pretty clean, so I'm not messing up anything. So I don't really need my stick necessarily. But I just want some tones, it's, it's almost white. I know that because the medium is a little bit dirty, this is not exactly white. And I do have some yellow near bots on this canvas that's still wet. This is gonna get dirty. So I'm not really worried about the fact that it's just almost pure white. And I'm putting on, and I can always just dab it later with a little bit of a yellow or whatever. 